action. because my mom's great at running a business. There's no one like better than us because we're all the best. A woman can be just as good at leading, a, say, a phone company as a man. I think we need to make it more equal and let people know that girls can be as good as boys at anything. Do you agree with gay marriage being legal? Yeah, I do. If you are a girl marrying a girl, then yeah, you should. Some people think it's not okay, but I think it's okay. But it doesn't matter about their gender or their race. Like, the ladies can go shopping together with men and then tell her you have to stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go with someone, you could go with someone, whoever you like. But if they're married to someone else, you can't do it. <laughs> Do you think some races or ethnic groups are born less intelligent than others? No. Just because I'm this colour doesn't make me any worse. It doesn't make me look better. It makes me look like me. All it means that you have a different skin colour. And what, and, and what does skin colour mean? Nothing. ADHD. Some people have been mean about me and then lies. One of my best friends has a disability. I'm fine, friends with disabilities. She can't see, but she doesn't need walking sticks. She, she just wears funny glasses. Even though you can't do something, maybe you can have another job that you can do. There's Anissa, Ria Chaya, Rayon. Asian. I got seven friends. Well, she she's the best friend I ever had. I have Gracie. I have lots of other friends. Me. Including this guy. I'm your brother, so of course I'm your friend. Um, we should turn the lights off. Be kind to each other. And share, share, t share. Um, I'm just sure. Don't be angry. Just keep, just keep calm. It's okay to be different. You need to think about things. There are problems in this world that can be solved if we just think things through. And I think that's all people need to do sometimes. I think it's fair to say the kids are all right, and actually, uh, if we listen to them, uh, we will be all right too, am I? Okay, brilliant. So today, I am going to talk to you uh, about the benefits of diversity and some of the research that I've been doing in my new book, uh, Diversify. And obviously, this panel is about why it's important to have women in the room uh, when AI is being created and designed and so I'm going to talk specifically uh, from the perspective of gender and why having women at the table matters. So I open the book with one of my favorite quotes, and it's by a man called William Sloan Coffin. And the quote is, diversity may be the hardest thing for a society to live with and perhaps the most dangerous thing for a society to be without. Now, William Sloan Coffin was an interesting man. He was born into one of the most privileged families in New York, but decided to spend his life fighting for those that were less privileged, and was a civil rights activist and a good friend of Martin Luther King. So in the book, I partnered with Oxford University, and we have lots of data and new research on how we better integrate disenfranchised groups and how society benefits as a result. 
So I want to tell you a little bit about my own story. So I was born uh, uh, into a family of Ghanaian immigrants. Uh, my parents came here in the 70s. And when I was a child, my grandmother died. And so my great-grandmother became my de facto grandma. And she would come to the UK three or four times a year. And I remember as a kid, I would be so excited by her trips because Ghanaian culture is steeped in mythology and folklore that's passed down generation to generation via an oral tradition. And I'd be so excited because I knew that she would start telling me stories, these amazing Ghanaian folk tales. And one of the stories that she used to tell me is the story of Anansi the spider. Now, Anansi starts out at the bottom of the animal kingdom and decides that he's kind of tired of being at the bottom and wants to figure out how to rise to the top. And realizes that perhaps the best way to do it is to own the most precious item in the animal kingdom, which is the stories of all wisdom. Now the thing is, the stories at the time belonged to the sky god. So Anansi goes along to the sky god and he says, I want to buy your stories. And the sky god says, well, number one, they're not for sale. And number two, what makes you think a low spider like you could even afford them? And actually, what would you do with them? So Anansi persists because the thing with being at the bottom of society is you're used to hearing no, and you have to figure out ways to turn those no's into yeses. And so he continues, and at that point, the sky god is on the back foot because when you're a sky god, you're not used to being challenged, and certainly not by a low, lowly spider. So the sky god decides, okay, I will give you the opportunity to try and gain these stories, but they're not for sale because kings and queens from the surrounding kingdoms have all tried and failed. So what the sky god does is he sets Anansi a seemingly insurmountable task. And so Anansi goes away, and as I said, when you're at the bottom of society, you have to figure out ways to rise. You have to figure out innovative ways to get the things that those that are privileged in society take for granted. So Anansi is able to complete the task and he goes back to the sky god. And the sky god is so impressed that at that moment, he not only gives him the stories, but he also anoints him as the king of the animal kingdom. And then Anansi shares the stories with the rest of humanity, and here I am, thousands of years later, retelling the tale. Now, the reason I reference the Anansi story is because I think there are two elements that are vital for success. The first is equal opportunity, because even though the sky god didn't believe that Anansi could complete the task. He still gave him the same opportunity anyway, the opportunity that he had given even seemingly worthier candidates. The second reason why I reference this story is because self-belief. Because fortunately, though the sky god didn't believe in Anansi, Anansi believed in himself. And I think when you have equal opportunity coupled with self-belief, anything as possible. Which brings me to my next story. In 1943, a group of 11 African American women enrolled in a war training program titled Women in Engineering at the Hampton Institute in Virginia. America was at war and needed all hands on deck, regardless of gender or race, in order to defeat Hitler and the Nazis. Upon graduating, these 11 women would go across the street to the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Lab, and there they would become known as human computers, tasked with completing mathematical equations that machines were not yet sophisticated enough to perform. Over the years, the department would grow and grow, and more women would join, including Katherine Johnson. By 1955, the war was over, but the Cold War was heating up, and America was determined to beat the Soviet Union in the space race. But there was a problem. The Russians had won up them and managed to get a rocket into space, which meant America had to become the first country to launch a man into space. But there wasn't anybody at NASA that could complete the mathematical equations needed for a safe launch. So that meant the heads of the space program had no choice 
but to go to the human computing department to see if anybody there could help. Fortunately, Catherine Johnson could. Her equations would ensure the safe launch and the safe return of John Glenn and the Mercury mission. Her calculations would go on to play a key role in the Apollo missions, including Apollo 11 and Apollo 13's safe rescue. For decades, her contribution would go unrecognized, until the daughter of one of her colleagues decided to tell the story of these remarkable women that she had grown up around. That story would become a New York Times bestseller, Hidden Figures, and then an international box office smash, starring Kevin Costner, Octavia Spencer, Taraji P. Henson, and Janelle Monet. Fortunately for Johnson, she would live to see these accolades and was awarded a Presidential Medal of Freedom. My goodness, what a difference two years makes, right? So in the, yes, memories, as they say, oh dear. In the UK, we have our own hidden figure, Rosalind Franklin, a woman so passionate about science that she made so many sacrifices just to get a seat at the table. She was focused, she was determined, and she was obsessive. And she would spend over 100 hours and a year's worth of calculations in order to produce the iconic Photo 51, the image that would play such a key role in the discovery of DNA. Unbeknownst to Franklin, one of her colleagues, Maurice Wilkins, would take that image and show it to two of her rivals, Watson and Crick, and they would use that image in their discovery of DNA, a discovery that would help the three men win a Nobel Prize. Sadly, Franklin would not live to know the impact that her work had had in this major breakthrough. But look, fortunately, history was kind and the truth would come out. So the reason I cite these two examples is because I believe they demonstrate what happens when women are in the room. When women are in the room, progress happens. When women are in the room, breakthroughs happen. When women are in the room, innovation happens. And so what I ask is that you all go back to your teams and look around and question, is everyone in the room? And if they're not in the room, then why? But I also think it's really important that you understand why it matters to have women in the room where innovation is concerned. So Professor Tom Malone from MIT uh, he is the head of the Center of Collective Intelligence there. He and his team have been studying what makes collective intelligence and what makes innovation possible. He has been studying this for the best part of two decades. And when they first started, they wanted to figure out, was it possible to measure group intelligence, or collective intelligence as they call it, in the same way that you could measure individual intelligence. So they discovered that yes, it was possible to measure group intelligence, but then they also wanted to take it one step further. Was it possible to measure group intelligence in the way that you could create models could, that could then be replicated? And again, they discovered that that was possible. Now I first learned about Tom Malone's work from the team at Astia who have been working with him for a very long time. And so what they realized was that the criteria needed for innovation wasn't what you would ordinarily expect. You would assume that if you want to find the most intelligent group, the way to do it is to bring the most intelligent individuals together and see if you have a group that is intelligent. That does not necessarily guarantee collective intelligence. So here are the three criteria vital for collective intelligence. The first was the social perceptiveness of a group. How well does the group understand each other? Is there empathy in the group? Can one colleague tell when another feels slighted? 
is there a level within the group where they can understand if there are actual problems arising? The second was the ease of conversation between the group. Did everybody feel heard? Did everybody feel that their opinions were valued and validated? And was there enough respect in the group to actually pick apart ideas to figure out the best solution? Now, the third piece I think is vital and so important. Your industry is an industry where data is king and data informs decision making. But for some reason, the third piece of data isn't being applied. And I believe as a result, you are all losing out. So the third piece of data was the number of women in a group. So what Professor Tom Malone said was in our study, if there were more women in the group, the group performed better. So if you want to have innovative teams performing to their best, then it's pretty simple. Hire more women. So we need to look at the blocks and why this doesn't happen. And I think it's only right that I turn the mirror on myself. If I'm asking you all to change, then I think I also need to look at the pieces within me that need to change. So I was born in a place called Walthamstow in East London. Is there anyone from Walthamstow? Oh, hello. Hi. Are you new Walthamstow or old Walthamstow? New. Oh, well, that's fine. That'll do. <laughs> so I was born in a place called Walthamstow, and I'm old Walthamstow. And when I was growing up there, uh, Walthamstow was one of the most multicultural areas in the UK. And diversity and difference were seen as an asset. My school, I would say, was the working class version of the UN. We had people from all over the world. And it was something that was celebrated where I was growing up. And I just want to say I didn't dress like that when I was at school. I recently went back to visit. And so from there, I went to KISS FM, uh, which is a radio station here in London. And the whole point of KISS FM was about uniting the young people of London through the power of music. So again, diversity and difference was something that was an asset and something that was celebrated. I then went to work on a TV show. Uh, called T4, interviewing people from all over the world. So again, diversity and difference was an asset. So when it came to this issue, I thought this was something that was second nature to me. So like most British television talent, I uh, decided to move to America to try and crack the states, as it were. And a few years ago, I was filming in Las Vegas. And a young man appeared on set who was covered head to toe in tattoos and I immediately felt uncomfortable around him and intimidated by him. And in that moment, I was able to understand this issue from a completely different perspective. As a woman of color, I've always seen this as being on the receiving end, as opposed to doing it myself. When the disconnect happens, you meet somebody who you assume is different to you, and the wall goes up. Well, I'm glad to say that I pushed through my discomfort, and I went to speak to him, and yes, he had had a difficult start in life. Yes, he had made some wrong choices, but fortunately, our sound man had given him an opportunity and had taken him on as an apprentice. And I couldn't help but think, if even somebody like me felt uncomfortable around him, how difficult it was gonna be for this young kid to get ahead. This young kid who was so excited by what he had to offer, my industry. And I think it's so important that we all question our unconscious bias, our limiting beliefs that we've all been programmed with in terms of who we think should lead and who we think should follow, who we think should be listened to and whose opinion doesn't count. Because actually, when we open up our minds in terms of who matters in our society and who we believe has something to contribute, that's when the magic happens that's when we all start to really benefit. So in the book, I have six steps that I'm calling the six degrees of integration. And these are six simple steps on how you can better connect with the other, whatever that other is for you. And the first step is about challenging your isms. What are your blocks? What are those unconscious biases? And how can you, number one, be aware of them 
and then number two, actually challenge them. And so on the website, diversify.org, we actually have uh, an ISM calculator that can help you do just that. Now, when we talk about gender equality and we talk about teams that are balanced, none of this is possible unless men have skin in the game. Women cannot achieve equality without the support of male allies. We need the good men to stand up and step up and support. And I want to tell you a story about one of these good men and the impact he was able to have in the, res in the world as a result. So Kingman Brewster was the president of Yale from 1963 until 1977. So in 1967, he decided to open the doors of Yale to women. There was much pushback, and many of Yale's wealthy donors and powerful alumni were completely against him. Even so, he understood in order for Yale to survive and still continue to be an elite institution, he had to source talent from the 50% of the population that had been excluded up until that point. The way he saw it was, the concern was not so much about what Yale could do for women, but for wi what women could do for Yale. Now, a lot of people get uncomfortable when you talk about targets and quotas and so on. But it's funny how we don't get uncomfortable about targets when we're talking about money. But when it comes to gender diversity, we flinch on it. But if we're serious, that's exactly what we have to do. What Brewster did was he set aside 600 places specifically for women. At the time, there weren't many Ivy League universities that enrolled women. So it meant that he had to go to so-called lesser institutions to source the women. Because he guessed that the likelihood of the kind of talent that Yale needed to actually thrive in that institution, chances are they were at those lesser institutions because they hadn't been given the opportunity to go to Yale. So here are uh, some of the first women uh, that attended Yale. You can see some of the guys aren't very impressed, but some are thinking this is a great idea. And so what was interesting was Amongst the pushback, many of the professors were actually completely against this. And one professor is quoted as saying, I feel a greater sense of accomplishment when I direct towards those who will one day have a greater role in society, men. I want to challenge that just a little bit because the third wave of women that attended Yale, there was a young law student and I think regardless of your political persuasion, it's fair to say that this young law student has definitely made her mark on the world. Without Kingman Brewster, Hillary Clinton would not be possible, which is why we need men. We need men on this mission. We cannot do it on our own. So to bring it back to your industry. Uh, last week, I was in Singapore, and I had the privilege of meeting Sophia. I hear she's here again today. Gets around a bit, does our soap. And when talking to Sophia, I asked her what she thought some of the dangers were in relation to AI. And what she said was the thing that worried her most was some of the unconscious bias that is being programmed into machines like her, and how Machines as we know, when machine learning takes place, the pace at which they learn tasks or ways of doing things rapidly outpaces what we as human beings can do. I don't need to tell you, this room, that. So imagine what that means when machines take on the worst of humanity. But also imagine what that means if we program machines to take on the best of humanity. Because these machines perhaps will be able to show us the way we should be in the world. And I believe that only happens when women are at the table and when women are part of that process. So we must be honest, this stuff is not easy. Diversity is only one bit. The inclusion piece is so important, where we create a culture 
where everybody feels valued and everybody is able to contribute. And in the current climate, there is a lot of tension. There are important arguments that are happening and important discussions around Me Too, around Time's Up. And I know that there are a lot of men who are not maybe saying this publicly that are perhaps frightened about hiring women or if you can be in a room alone with a female colleague or whatever. And what I say, again, the good men have nothing to worry about because actually what we need to do is work together to create a new way of being in the workplace and in doing so benefit and create things that society has never seen. And so to close, what I'll say is female success does not mean male failure. This is not a zero-sum game. And I'll finish with one of my favorite quotes by Margaret Mead, which is, every time we liberate a woman, we liberate a man. And I, for one, look forward to working in a world full of liberated women and men. And fortunately, you are the people designing the future. You are the people that can create that. So on that note, thank you very much. <laughs>